G'day folks, and welcome back to another edition of the Rough Consensus Podcast. Today we have the Head of Research at Galaxy Digital, Alex Thorne. Now we met in Nashville for the first time and we're on a panel talking about the Bitcoin four-year cycle. Is it going to stick around? Is it going to change? And this is a question that I have received so many times over the last couple of months. So we really dive into what market structure has changed, how the ETFs, options, derivatives, how they are going to change market structure, and whether that four-year cycle, what are the bullish catalysts, what are the bearish catalysts, is it going to stick around, does the halving matter, is it priced in? We cover a whole range of topics, and I had a lot of fun with this conversation. I think you will as well. So without further ado, let's get stuck right into the episode. Just before we get started, do check out our newsletter over at checkonchain.com. We do have a charting suite, which has got all of the on-chain charts that I personally use, as well as derivatives and ETF metrics. And over at the newsletter, we actually release two weekly updates and a masterclass every single week. Um, and we also have a, a Q&A that goes on once a month. So if you have any questions, you can always ask, and I will package those up and build it into a monthly Q&A. So do check us out over at checkonchain.com and enjoy the episode. Cheers. G'day, folks, and welcome back to another edition of the Rough Consensus Podcast. And uh, today I've got Alex Thorne on from uh, Galaxy Research. Mate, we met in Nashville. It's uh, it's good to get you on the pod. James Check, hello. Great to have met you a few months ago and great to be here. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, mate, I, I, really, uh, I really enjoyed your monologue you did the other day on the uh, Galaxy Brains uh, uh, pod, which I, I'm, I'm uh, pro more Alex on the mic. I think it was a really, really good episode, just giving like an assessment of where Bitcoin is, how the markets change, what the landscape looks like beyond Bitcoin as well. Um, what's your kind of general, if you would like really give us the Cliff Notes view, what's your view on the, the Bitcoin crypto landscape as it stands here and, you know, approaching the end of 2024? Yeah, I think it's been a very interesting year. I think a lot of people were wondering um, when Bitcoin made a new all-time high before the halving, which was sort of a first, um, what that meant for the the market cycle and everyone's talking about these cycles. And I think it's been, it's been frankly for a lot of people in broader crypto, a very difficult year because the market has been so dramatically driven by Bitcoin. And yet you haven't seen that ball of money move down the risks uh, stack. Right. So like Ethereum, no all time high uh, this year so far. Um, and, and frankly, I mean, was at some points in the year was straight up flat year to date. Right. I mean, in August, right. And it, had a huge drawdown of 25% in August, Ether did. Um, Bitcoin was down 10%, right? And I think if you look at the top you know, coins, very, very few of them have made an all-time high in 2024. It basically is a Bitcoin-driven market. Um, and, and so much of the um, enthusiasm for broader crypto is driven by these you know, Web3 narratives, right? NFTs, the metaverse, gaming, DeFi. Most of them not very salient in 2024, right? I mean, quite bad, down bad, you might say. NFT volumes, absolutely just very, very low trading volume. Really, people aren't trading them very much, not not even near the levels that we saw in 21 and 22. Um, you know, stable coins are a bright spot. DeFi is a, I would say, a, a decent spot. People are using DeFi. It has become an essential utility in crypto, but it's really only used by on-chain wealth. It's not penetrating into traditional finance. Some of that is due to regulation, but um, you know, and, and some people say there's a counter here, like, well, what about real world assets, all these treasury bills and private credit and stuff coming on chain? That's pretty much opportunistic by some traditional players just to service what is now a parallel economy of on chain wealth. It's not taking companies public on the blockchain. It's not uh, trading on Uniswap instead of the NASDAQ. And, and we haven't really made progress on that at all this year. So um, and, and that's like the best of the sort of crypto narratives is, is DeFi. Obviously, I don't think anyone has said the word metaverse in 18 months, right? Like in these these things, there's no Jimmy Fallon showing his bored ape on a on a TV show. Um, I think that's contributed to a lot of malaise. In fact, the the sort of powerful narratives in the crypto market outside of Bitcoin um, have been meme coins, which I think everybody knows is a, a cynical kind of zero sum PVP sort of market, um, and if some last you know, the, the lengths of Dogecoin, it'll, there will be very few of them that do. Um, it's not an extremely sustainable form of market activity. Um, and then, and then the others are infrastructure things on the Ethereum side. You have things like restaking and modularity. Again, this is building the roads. I think some people, including me are wondering where are the cars, where are the applications that users want to use and the whole application layers, you know, some of the examples I, I mentioned are, 
is, is I would say at best, mostly stagnant this year. So a very Bitcoin driven market hasn't seen the rotations into other assets down the risk curve as, as we had in previous cycles. And I think, you know, people are wondering whether we will. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's contributing to a, a disillusionment among frankly builders in the space. Um, part of it maybe is because venture activity is, is down still so much from, you know, 21 and 22, which each saw about 30 billion invested into startups by VCs, uh, both of those years. Um, whereas now we're on track for like eight or 9 billion annually, which you know, it's still a boatload of money. Um, maybe that's maybe with more money, we'll get <laughs> the applications that people want. Um, I think this story for Bitcoin is, is very positive and it's one of the only ones that's very positive. And so that makes the idea that there's a broad asset class beyond Bitcoin um, feel tenuous. And, and that is contributing to some malaise. I think that's OK. Right. I mean, I think Bitcoin obviously has product market fit as digital gold, if nothing else. And there's interesting stuff happening on Bitcoin and, and the Bitcoin ETFs have been wildly successful. Um, something like 18 billion in net cumulative inflows since launch versus minus 700 million from the ETH ones. And, you know, they launched into a very difficult and tougher and different market. The Ethereum ETFs did, but nonetheless, I think that's a good that or like look at the ETH BTC ratio. I think these are just sort of good benchmarks for um, the market that we're in. And, you know, Bitcoin and Ether and stables are 70 percent of the total market cap in crypto. So stable coins, by the way, a bright spot, but not really a directional play, right? Not like from, from an investment standpoint, um, it's not something that <laughs> if they work correctly right there, the number stays flat. It doesn't go up. So, yeah, I mean, that uh, this is just me taking stock of it. I don't I'm not saying necessarily that it's good or bad that it's this way um, or and I frankly, I'd be surprised if the app layer doesn't make a resurgence in crypto at, at some point. Um, it's just I think people are a little jaded. They're used to like the, this common thing that we saw in 17 and 21 of you know, first Bitcoin moons, then ETH moons, then alt season comes, then like whatever, and the, the ball of money rolls around. And there's a variety of reasons why that hasn't happened, but it hasn't happened yet. And I think people, you know, cryptocurrency traders, um, venture investors, builders are wondering if it will. Yeah, I think that's a really good assessment. My, my like general read is it's very 2019-esque. In terms of like the vibes, this is very 2019. It is a Bitcoin dominant market. And I mean, I, I've flip flops for so many years, particularly on Ethereum being you know the num number two asset, and just like working out what do I actually use this stuff for. And I did an opinion piece some time back, and when I really like take stock and reflect my usage of Ethereum, which I just don't do very often anymore, when I look at what I was using it for, it was more or less to borrow money to go levered long another crypto asset, right, and then you put it back in the vault, and that kind of secures your lending. So, but at the end of the day, I was using it for speculation. And that was the primary toolkit when I'm really honest with myself. Now, for a long time, things like Compound was like one of the things that kind of made sense because I could see like like a reverse repo facility, right? People put collateral in, they get collateral out. But then you end up in this weird world where like the real world asset space. And I think this is a really interesting mental exercise because real world assets, stable coins are probably the best example of, ultimately you don't need, do you need that level of high trust minimization? I think this is why things like Tron and arguably Solana, like they probably aren't objectively as decentralized, but do they do the job of moving around a ledger entry that Tether can freeze and BlackRock can freeze and move? Probably they do enough of a job. So there's a like weird optimization of, are you too decentralized? Which actually goes against a Bitcoin narrative, but is Ethereum too decentralized? Yeah, I agree with that, actually. And I just came from Solana Breakpoint in Singapore and I was there for Token 2049. And this is one of the things I was thinking about was, it is objectively more centralized than Ethereum. And um, in some ways that, you know, there's, they're making incredible technological progress on, on new clients that jump trading guys just, you know, launched this new client fire dancer on Solana mainnet that apparently is hyper performant, and, but it requires a lot of computing uh, power, which of course means that it will become more centralized. Um, and so I, I, um, but that lets them go faster. And, and I agree your point about the Tron example for Tether is a great one because I get asked all the time um, by reporters and people like, why is there, why, why are people using Tether on Tron? Like, isn't Tron like a worse blockchain? The, the thing is for, for tokenized assets issued by a real world issuer, um, they can always just cancel those tokens and reissue them to the correct owner on a different blockchain. So if something happens on Tron, 
they can just tether will just cancel all of those and say they'll build a little website where you show up with your tron wallet you don't need to um you don't need to have tron the network even be up right you just sign a message with your address they look back at a prior snapshot whatever whenever they decide to and when you cryptographically prove that you did own that tron address then they're just like okay give us your ethereum address and they send the tethers there and the same is true for securities that might be tokenized or other real world assets so yeah, I think it, it's a question about what you really need decentralization for. I think, in a way, Ethereum has been a victim of its own success. It is significantly more decentralized than most of its competitors. And I, I don't view Bitcoin as a competitor to Ethereum or vice versa. Um, but that means that it's kind of a dumpster fire of development. Like, it's it's got all these crazy... It's like a giant ball of wires, right? Like, they've been trying to... And, by the way, it's still trying to play the community in Ethereum, still trying to play this technologically technological competition game with these all L1 competitors like Solana, which are much more centralized from a development standpoint. And so it's very hard, right? I think, you know, example is if, you, if Bitcoiners think about how hard it is to upgrade Bitcoin, imagine if the Bitcoin code base was 10 times as big and 10 times as complicated and at 10... 10 times as many native features to, to look at and worry about dependencies and secondary effects, second order effects of upgrading. Like that's what Ethereum faces. And, and it, it, I think that it's just hard, right? Most of the stuff that they've put through um, is again, it's sort of like infrastructure layer stuff. So, um, you know, I, I agree with your assessment, James, about, you know, tokenized assets. And, and the question is really, what do we need something super decentralized for? I think digital gold, long-term, generational wealth storage, right? High fidelity, high value transactions. Yes. Like, you know, like moving a couple dollars around in lieu of money gram or something, maybe not, right? Like high velocity stuff. Maybe it doesn't need to be etched in a digital stone tablet. Yeah. And I think that's a really good framework. And, and you mentioned the, uh, the ETFs. I thought, you know, when I look at the Ethereum ETFs, they have had net outflows, but we do have to give them a little bit of space here because they have launched into a choppy period in time. Right. And they also have to deal with their GBTC moment, right? They've got to go through all these supply overhangs. Now, my like broad assessment of the last six months since the ETF peak is I've been calling it choppy but structured for Bitcoin. I've been quite surprised by the I mean, we had a 32% drawdown only during the yen carry trade for all of four hours. For the most part, 25% is about as bad as it's been. If you look at any previous bull, 25% on the lower bound of how deep it goes. So I've been quite impressed with how much Bitcoin's held up. And one of the things that's been just enormous this last six months has been supply overhangs. We've seen Mt. Gox, we've seen German government selling, we've seen the US government selling. It's, and these are all back-to-back -back episodes, right? Yeah. Um, uh, GBTC. I mean, th that's been a whole... I know you guys and, and your team has covered a lot of that. What's your thoughts on this like supply overhang, how Bitcoin's dealt with it, how Ethereum's dealt with it? What's that like general framework there for supply? Yeah, I mean, I think just to, to echo your point on the Ethereum ETFs, it's not even just the chop market they launched into. Imagine, remember last fall in 23, the relentless multi-month drumbeat of anticipation for the Bitcoin ETF? In retrospect, oh, yes. I think we'll all look back on that as one of the greatest times in like Bitcoin markets with, you know, James Safart and Eric Balchunas, like we're all like reading filings and looking for clues. And, and we it know- It was worth how refreshing Twitter. Exactly. It really was. Yeah, it wasn't just, um, you know, fight videos and whatever, you know, awful election coverage we're all forced to look at now. But um, that relentless drumbeat that then, of course, you know, finalized with this explosive launch, the largest ETF launch in history, like the Ethereum was, was not going to be able to compete with that. It might have the issuers were not prepared. I mean, really, I think most were caught off guard. So there just wasn't that marketing build up. I think from the supply overhang. Great, great point. Um, great question. It, it, it was like you know, it's almost like deja vu all over again. I've been being asked about the Mt. Gox estate for years. And, and I was so happy to be able to say, yeah, okay, it's probably a lot, but like, it's not gonna be like at least another year or two. Like we can just keep pushing this off. Well, that, that was no longer the case this year. And we started to realize that um, like in May, I was, I started writing about how like we basically thought it was imminent because um, I was hearing from custodians and some of the big funds, the creditor funds that were themselves going to be the big recipients from a lot of the coins for a lot of the coins that, that as far as they knew, like all the steps are complete. So like, you know, it could take another six months, but there was no more steps to be complete. And so I, I was saying that it was likely to start in June. Um, and I think they started July 4th. So um, and it was a lot of coins, right? I mean, I think mm. probably like 85,000 coins or so were distributed. Um I, I, you know, we, we didn't think it would be like a very 
negative thing for the market, but certainly the headlines would make it scary. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised that we were right. I mean, there's reasons why, like, you know, but um, the government coins also, the German government, I think, had a much more sustained negative impact on the price um, at the time. Um, but they, you know, sold out everything. It's There's always going to be more of these, you know. I mean, some somebody's going to, some rich person's going to get their coins stolen or, or seized or some business will, you know, go. I mean, the German one was like a illegal movie pirating website is where they got the bitcoins right it is nice to yeah i do think we're past most of these i think the remaining there are still some silk road coins in the u.s government control i think the vast majority though of what the u.s government holds is um recovered from the bitfinex hack which you know i'm not sure but i'm pretty sure typically the process when the government or the law enforcement recovers your stolen property is they give it back to you so presumably those coins will get given back to bitfinex and not sold and then cash returned to Bitfinex. I'm not certain, but... Or, or, or turned into a treasury asset. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, right? Yeah, with, with um, you know, former President Trump's proposal, the vast majority of the coins the government holds today are, should be returned to their owners. So I, I, I'm i surprised, frankly, that they haven't already been. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we've gotten through a lot of it, to be honest, and, and that's very positive. And then um, think about FTX, too. Well, on the Bitcoin side, they don't really have any Bitcoin. Not not really. Um, most of what they had was Solana and other coins, and they've mostly sold the Solana off market to institutional investors. Right. They're, they're basically done as well. So um, BlockFi, Genesis, Celsius, all done distributing coins or cash. So it does feel like from a supply overhang standpoint, we have, you know, greener pastures ahead finally. It's a little bit of a new era. It we've kind of left the, and I, I think the ETFs are that delineation between the old world and the new world, right? Yeah. We've kind of got this this post crypto native environment. We're still not there yet because you know I see trade fi analysts saying all the time that the ETFs are number one and they're you know driving everything. By my assessment, they're about 10, 20 percent, and the rest of the existing markets that 80. Um, that will evolve over time. Uh, a couple of points on the the German government. That was actually a really interesting dynamic, uh, from my assessment at least. There was uh, 48,000 coins, and it was distributed over about a month period. In the first three three weeks, they distributed 10,000 coins, so the, the minority share, and that's when the price, I think it was like 60, and it went down to 53. So that was like the market front running. Mm -hmm. And then as they sold the remaining 38,000 coins, the market actually rallied through it. And that, to me, was just a sign of a supply absorption. Someone was just down there just letting those coins come to them. Mm -hmm. um, but the other one, I enjoyed your coverage of Mt. Gox, and it might be worth just touching on this because I get this question all the time. My assessment, by and large, was that I didn't think many Mt. Gox coins would be sold. And the, like the core thesis there, they've held out for like a decade, and then they, they've been you know being chased to sell their claims forever. These folks probably have coins from last Tuesday, and they're probably waiting for the cycle high like everybody else. So yeah. I, I don't think they've been sitting there waiting for their Gox coins to come back to uh, to sell. What was your kind of instinct on on how many of those coins would get sold and why? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think um, I think at a high level, um, I view the Mt. Gox creditors as comprised of significantly more diamond-handed types, right, entities. First of all, a huge amount of the supply was going to be delivered to these funds that raised, that, that bought claims, right, these claims funds. And, and you're exactly right. Th these claims funds were pursuing the creditors with very, like, very compelling offers for a long time. I mean, as high as like the $60,000 coin range in 21 and two. So like um, people had a chance to get out. Like they, there were, there's a lot of this, probably 20 or 30,000 of the coins were effectively bought as claims by these funds. And, and I talked to some of these funds and, and the largest of them, and they, they were like, who, what, what is the character of their LPs, right? Are they going to have to then sell the coins to deliver cash? vast majority of those LPs are like cryptocurrency OGs basically who want cheap coins. So I, I, I didn't see that. The, so that's probably the biggest single cohort of recipients for these funds. And they didn't sound like a big source of sell pressure. If their LPs are, I'm not going to name, but I, I know many that are in those funds. Like these are long-term hodlers who see an opportunity to get coins for a discount. Right? So they, they want the coins mostly, I would say. Then in general, like if you were in Mt. Gox, like you were doing Bitcoin, you know, a decade ago, um, you probably skew more to the long term hodler mentality. You, you're, you're more cypherpunk than the average new entrant today. You're more technologically savvy than the average new entrant today. 
So, and, and, and we can see some of them. I mean, there are, there were, um, um, there were a bunch of OG Bitcoiners that had coins, right? And so I'm like, are they going to sell those coins? It doesn't seem like they would need to. And then there was even a chunk of coins, this poor souls from another bankruptcy, Bitcoinica. They got, they went into <laughs> bankruptcy and then to safeguard the recovered Bitcoin, they put them in Gox and then Gox went bankrupt. So like, even if those guys want to sell, now that they're distributing to Bitcoinica, they're going to have to go through a whole nother process of figuring out what to do with them, right? Oh, so like, it, they may be sold, but they wasn't going to hit the market right away. Um, and then there was a dynamic of like, well, actually, like to get paid out now, you you had to elect this early payout, which is just funny because it was still like 10 years, it took 10 years, but, and then take a small haircut. And we're like, probably most will do that. I mean, you really want to wait like another, basically the bankruptcy court and, and the state had said like, you know, to get p potential Instead of 90% or 85% of your coins back, if you want 100, you, you might have to wait years more. And it's like, so I don't know. I, I just think it, it was, look, it was hard because Japanese bankruptcy is, first of all, written in Japanese. So a lot of the world doesn't speak Japanese. Second of all, a, you know, a very arcane, like many bankruptcies, pro, you know, complicated, strange process. I would say relatively unclear communication from the estate to the market. That all contributed to a lot of fear, but. I mean, look, in the end, I mean, those coins have now it's they, they've they've been distributed now for well over a month. Like, I think I think if you were going to sell, you know, maybe there was like a, a, a 70K ish top created during Donald Trump's speech in Nashville. And like, you know, someone's got to be selling when the price, you know, when you hit resistance on the way up. So, like, maybe it was some of them. But, um, yeah, I'm just happy it's over. I hope we don't have many more of these. Yeah, the, the, the bears keep finding more coins. It seems to be the uh, the main moving forward. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, the, the ETFs have been a major shift. Uh, I think there's kind of two things, or maybe three things that have really changed the market structure th this cycle, at least in my eye. One is obviously the spot ETFs, and that's like a net spot bid, um, and also just new access. The other one is CME is now the gorilla in the room when it comes to open interest and, and futures. Um, so the, um, the CME is now bigger than Binance, which is a pretty significant shift. Um, and uh, the other one is options, which we saw, uh, I think, yeah. this week. The SEC has just uh, approved options on the BlackRock ETF. What's your kind of view on this this interesting interplay? Because we've definitely seen a cash and carry trade where they buy spot ETF, um, short CME futures. O options are just an enormous. I mean, for a lot of people, that's going to be the killer product for for Wall Street yeah. with volatility capture and all that. How does that change the the market moving forward? Yeah, it's huge, right? I mean, and I I don't come from an options background, but I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, you know, running research here at Galaxy, we're one of the biggest, if not the biggest, options OTC market, uh, you know, dealer in in crypto. And so, not the ETF options, but you know, spot traditional options or, or over the counter options. And you, you can do so many different strategies with options trading, right? Like options are. I think that's why the the most sophisticated traders absolutely love options. And options market is already massive in Bitcoin. To be clear, massive. Um, as big as and, futures now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, honestly, it's probably a lot bigger. It's hard to know because so much of it is done over the counter bilaterally. And but you, you get some in, in Intel if you obviously Deribit, a lot of stuff that's bilateral may still clear on Deribit or right. Like There's some places to get good data, but it's massive. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's going to unlock an enormous amount of of granularity and specificity that traders can now do. And, and obviously being able to do them. You know, it's great to work with Galaxy. <laughs> We're good at it, right? Or, or Wintermute or GSR, or whomever the, the dealer is, or trade on Darabit. But it's also great to trade on a, like, uh, you know, a listed option or a, um, that's tied to an underlying highly liquid American regulated ETF. Like, the, it's going to be big, I think. It's going to get a lot of interest. I think you're going to see a lot of volatility selling uh, from it. So, like, vol, vol is going to go down. This this is We've seen this with other assets that have options, like, um, and that, you know, that jives with the whole story that we think about when, it, uh, Bitcoin's institutionalization volatility has gone down over time. Um, you know, on a realized basis, if you look at realized vol on basically any rolling number of days, like I, I usually do 30, but you could do any, it, it is basically down for years and it'll probably continue to go down as liquidity increases, um, you know, and vol decreases allocators can put much larger amounts of capital into Bitcoin. And that sort of has a feedback cycle loop of continuing to dampen vol. And again, same thing, like you're going to see so many people using, you know, doing income generation strategies, using options on it. Um, so I, I think it's a big deal. We don't know exactly when they'll launch. Um, I guess the SEC gave approval. 
uh, for on IBIT, but we need um, the Options Clearing Corp and the CFTC apparently to also approve. And I, my understanding is like there's not any, there's no real artificial delay in that, but it's like there's a queue of others that are waiting for a CFTC approval. And so like, you know, they'll get to it when they, I mean, I really don't know. I think it could be as late as Q1. So it could be several more months, but um, look, it's just it, the, the ETFs are the tokenization in TradFi, right? They're the wrapper that makes things so easy for, for TradFi investors. And they want, those investors want everything else that comes along with it. They want to be able to trade options on them as well. And I think you're going to see a lot of volume. It's going to impact, you know, even frankly, like companies like Galaxy. Like, I mean, somebody was saying, well, this is great. Now the miners can hedge their production using options. And I was like, guys, to be clear, like the miners have been able to do that for years. We, you know, we trade with miners, right? Like they, there's, um, so, but I think it, it's going to do interesting things to the existing um, crypto OTC and and listed options markets, right? Because now you can sort of trade these in traditional traditional finance houses, and it's gonna it's, so it's, there's gonna be a market impact in terms of structure of the market as well. Um, that's quite interesting as well. But I think it'll bring a lot of volume in the end and, and contribute to lowered volatility over time. Yeah, and what I think is interesting, I've been noticing as gold has been going on its run, right? Because it's obviously a far more financialized asset than Bitcoin. And volatility is really like the, you know, this is Sailor's point, right? The volatility is the heartbeat of, of any asset. Um, what we do see is that volatility tends to uptick during bull markets. So Bitcoin trades much more like a commodity where you get this uptick in volatility during rallies. And unlike stocks, which is just this like manipulated, slow, straight line higher, you get high volatility shocks to the downside, whereas Bitcoin is kind of the opposite. Bear markets are low volatility periods. And what I just watching gold over the last couple of months, it essentially does what Bitcoin does, which is it reprices. It goes through these long, sideways, volatility, captured kind of zones, and then it just teleports to a new range and mm -hmm. rinse, repeat. In many ways, Bitcoin has been doing this, right? It goes on like these 10x runs, and then it spends three and a half years just going absolutely nowhere. Um, to that point, um, the miners, I think that's a really interesting point because I, I think not a lot of listeners will understand options in, in depth. Literally before this call, I was recording like a, options 101 for my subs just yeah. to help them understand like what the hell are they i think the mining case is a really good one um, do you want to just talk through the logic of why would a miner use and benefit from options to, to essentially hedge their income yeah i mean there, there's a lot of strategies you can do using options but i think if we think of they're incredibly effective for hedging a portfolio right like or hedging against some asset that you that you hold right and and bitcoin miners are extremely long bitcoin right like they have data centers filled with machines to make Bitcoin. The machines are expensive. They have long-term power arrangements that they intend to use the electricity to create Bitcoin. They may also literally hold a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheets, right? Their stocks, if they're publicly traded, often trade in some correlation with Bitcoin. Um, so all of that is true, right? But if you're trying to build a long-term sustainable industrial manufacturing business, commodities business, which is how I at least loosely think of Bitcoin miners, um, you've got to to be have your businesses business cycles tied to such a volatile asset um, is very, makes running your business very difficult. Let's just put it that way, right? And we saw this. I think miners did not hedge the value, uh, did not hedge the Bitcoin price or their ASICs or whoever it was nearly enough in twenty one. And you did see a whole bunch of them just puke their entire Bitcoin treasuries. Basically, have to sell it all to just pay to keep the lights on, right? And many didn't want to do that, and and they I think. Options are complicated. Like I said, I'm not an expert, but I'm saying, but neither were they, right? And I think this is sort of what happened was like, you know, smart people are telling the miners, and I think they've gotten smarter um, on, on these types of strategies, but they can basically lock in like guarantee, guaranteed profits by hedging against their the what they think the price of Bitcoin is or will be or or, or uh, in the future, and and that that it's the same thing with gold miners like they they utilize you know strategies to hedge against the, the price of gold like so if you're inherently long bitcoin you you want to take out some level of short bitcoin position right so that if it does go down and your long position de decays then you've got a short position that goes up and can help just make your business more stable yeah and the other thing that i thought was what would work for miners is because they know they're going to have bitcoin in the future they will be able to deliver if they do a covered call strategy they exactly. could essentially, you know, Bitcoin price is 64K. They say, well, I'm going to sell a call at 70K. And if I don't get filled, I collect the premium, I sell it again, and then I keep selling it. And then eventually the price goes through 70, 
they don't care that they sold at 70 and the price is 73 because they used to be at 60 and they collect yeah. income between now and then. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. this is true that you can do that, that selling call strategy. Anyone that has a lot of Bitcoin that is long Bitcoin in general, it's a great strategy for income generation. Exactly. And, and I think all those strategies will make the options market and this, this kind of shift. To me, you've got the ETFs. The options were a natural progression from that. This to me feels like it's it's changed things. And this is where I think I want to get to the, the topic that you and I really want to banner, banner about, which is the cycle, right? The four-year mm. cycle. This yeah. is what our panel was at, uh, in, in Nashville. Does it exist? Yeah. Is it going to continue? Um, I don't know the best way to frame this, but I was, I was thinking maybe we could go like the four arguments just to lay out like why would a four-year cycle play out? And then perhaps unpick that and say, well, moving forward, is that just like a, you know, a thing that was of the past? Was it just spurious? Um, and then kind of go the against path. What's your thoughts on the uh, the, the four year cycle? What drives yeah. it? Is it going to persist? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's very easy if you look at like the first having cycle to say that like the Bitcoin supply schedule is very impactful, right? If there's not that many people owning or trading it, but it's, you know, inflating at a rate of 35 plus percent a year, which it was. I mean, the first, if you do the annualized inflation rate, right, like you have to cut off the first like couple months of the chart because like it's uh, it's like, you know, a million percent at first, of course. Um, so, I mean, I think one reason that everybody obviously talks about this is the halving cycle is also four years. And that's why we say things like, oh, people were caught off guard by a new all time high before the halving. It usually came after the halving. OK, um, you know, that that had been a supply, a significant supply event in the past. Right. But of course, it halves every four years. So to me, like now, right, we were coming down to, you know, um, like 450 coins produced per day on average by the network from 900. That's not a lot. 900 wasn't a lot either, to be honest. Like when you look at the daily float of Bitcoin as an asset, trading asset, it's way higher than that. So like it's as a percentage of float is sort of how I would think about it being um, impactful. Um, it mattered a lot more before. It matters less every time. Um, so there's other things that I could throw out here that I'm, I've never really looked, but people talk about the global liquidity cycle, the, the growth or decline of balance sheets of central banks or of money supplies, right? Also do sometimes appear to, to flow in, in, in cycles that, that you can draw lines on charts and looks like maybe that is a correlation with Bitcoin. I mean, I, I don't disagree. I just, there's other, there's other thing. I mean, even the one thing that's strange, we get a presidential election after every having so far, basically, right? It's like, every time right it was it's 12 16 you know uh 20 and 24 have been the havings um and those are also presidential election years so um there's a variety of things and, and then there's natural the cycles of biz, business cycles and you talk about rates and 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 central bank monetary policy also in some cases has lined up on a four-year thing so i don't know um I do think that the having mattered a lot in the beginning and it increasingly does not matter and, and frankly shouldn't matter. It obviously shouldn't have mattered then if markets were efficient, you'd price it in, you know, you know, that great um, Reddit screenshot, everything is priced in like everything yep. like you, you were priced in James, like you, your parents were priced in, right? Like the, um, death, one, one the, my favorite death was of the universe the ETFs, is priced in. <laughs> when the ETS went live, the question was, were they priced in? And I think it was like three weeks after three weeks, the price was exactly the same. It's like yeah. oh, after they went live, it's like, I mean, that looks priced into me. But then it's like, how long are they priced in for? Because the launch of the ETFs can be priced in, but no one knows who's going to hit the green button in what size right. for how long. They're That's all the right. variables that kick into it. Right. It's something that is a flows catalyst. Like it fundamentally can't be priced in. Yeah. The headline can be priced in, but the yes. actual market, for how long, you know, changing event or, or, in this case, market access vehicle simply can't be priced in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That That's a very common question. Bitcoin has seemed to move in this four years thing. And, and I think it's actually fair to say that it still is, although it pulled forward a little bit. Um, like if you just look at the price chart, like you can you can make the case that there's this four ish year cycle still. Um, I, I think it's going away. I think it will. It's go interesting because if you uh, and the the only other thing because I had a list of things I had halving macro liquidity elections I think you touched on all of those <laughs> the only one that yeah. I add in there is this like psychological component people love to do that chart where it's and I've got them on my website where it's like um, uh, different cycles since the lows since the all time high since the halving yep. and a lot of people like to share the halving one be like oh look at this shitty performance it's like that's guys, what the halving. <laughs> 
Uh, so I, I actually did tweet useful. that, and I was like, you know, I'm going to delete this, actually. I think the cycle low might be the better one. <laughs> the cycle low, exactly. So, so the last point that I had on, like, what drives a four-year cycle, it's that investor psychology. And I like the cycle low one because we all know, well, I think most people listening, you know what it feels like on the last day of a bear market. It's bloody awful. Everything is zero. Like you just, it's just despair everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Some people are bold and step in, but that recovery process, there's like a psychological timeline where people, it takes time for the asset to recover. The PTSD needs to fade away. Um, and likewise, there's like a, there's like a time limit on once you bust through all time high and stuff gets real euphoric, the market just can't sustain that indefinitely. You, it just runs out of steam. So You've got these kind of two bear market recovery duration, and we are literally in the exact same spot as the last two cycles right now from the cycle low. And then once you get above the bull market top, you're now in price discovery and investors get exhausted after 12 months. So there's like these kind of time frames where the market usually can't keep going in that path before it hits some kind of saturation point. So I think that feeds inward as well. I think it does. That's a great point. And because I've been through a few of these and you, you do, you get tired. You get tired of it being too low. At some point, people just smash by. They're like, this is too cheap. Yeah. I'm buying, right? Like, I remember Not this enough. in March 2020, like, like during that March 12th crash to, like, 3,200 at one point overnight. People, we, I mean, I was running this venture fund at Fidelity, this crypto VC fund, and we were like, we had this other vehicle, like, with some cash in it. I was like, we should just buy this Bitcoin right now. I was like, right, it's same thing, 16.5 to start 2023. I think people were just like, dude, that's too cheap. Like bear market's over, time to buy. Like we, it's just too cheap. Um, they get sick of being, you know, bearish, right? And the same thing, you, um, which is another thing that's sort of different about this cycle. And go back to the, we talked about the very top of this pod, um, how this one actually feels different. People were expecting that by now that the the rest of crypto would feel that way as well, almost fatigue with the bull market. Yes. But you you had some fatigue from the Bitcoin bull market, or you know, some sideways like chop, like. So it feels like some fatigue, but the other guys didn't even, you know, get out of bed and put their shoes on yet, they feel like. So they're like, wait a second, where's my chance to be fatigued? Um, you're right, though, is you're just ripping, like, think about 21, right? I mean, we actually, you know, we ripped through, like, March, and then Elon rugged with this, like, late yep. realization that Bitcoin used electricity. And then, you know, we, we have another rally in the fall based on the sort of, theoretically, what, around the um, launch of futures ETFs, basically, I guess, would be the the catalyst um and people are just you know just tired it got, it got back up to the prior you know to like the 69k level and i think you know buyers like apparently just looked at it and said like wait a sec should it really be higher than that like are we really there um it's hard to measure the psychology but i've lived through feeling it and um yeah that probably stays but it, as you have a larger portion of supply held by institutional investors and in, in vehicles like etfs with longer time frames and less frequent portfolio rebalancing and lower volatility, like it'll play less and less of a factor, but they'll probably still exist. So what's really interesting, I ran a study recently on uh, inflation adjusted Bitcoin price. So I tried to frame it as like what we see is the price chart. What we feel is probably, I would say for most people, what you feel is your $2020. What is Bitcoin's price in your $2020? Yeah. And if you factor in that component, What's kind of wild is that November, that second all-time high in 2021, was actually a lower high. It wasn't mm -hmm. a higher high. And if you look at, um, at where we currently are, the bottom of our that 25% drawdown from our current all-time high is the same depth below the of the 2019 peak from the 2017 high. So you've got this like, how do we feel? We actually feel exactly like we're in the mid-cycle mm -hmm. correction because that's literally where our 2020 dollars are now. How you price that, right? I looked at like CPI. We know CPI is a lower bound. I did, let's let's put 2X and 3X CPI. That's probably closer to the truth. That's how we feel. And this was the findings. Like that, that is kind of interesting that we probably That's are. That's very interesting. Did you publish that already? I got to see that. I um, did. No, I I'll, yeah. I'll send you a copy of the report. But yeah, the idea was like, really how do you feel? How do you see? And um, the where other are we one now, is like on the current inflation adjusted all time high would have actually been what, like 85K or something like the 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a few ways you can do it, right? You can either say, well, what is the inflation adjusted all time high? But the way I went about it is the reverse and say, well, what is the $2020 high? Where are we if you actually depreciate the value of the dollar? And I think we peaked at about 45,000. And um, if you look at it from an MVRV ratio, which is the unrealized profit or loss, we were very mm -hmm. close to break even. So, and wow. it, it it probably felt about that, right? So in terms of our purchasing power, we feel like we're at break even because we are. 
Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I think that's a good way to think about it. I think it's sort of people have a really hard time internalizing and, and like building mental models around inflation, right? It's one of the reasons it's such an insidious problem for society Absolutely. when you, when you see it. Um, but you're right. I feel like they innately kind of feel it though. And um, yes. so I can't wait to look at that. And the way I framed it up is that we had a 25% drawdown from, so from 73K. We've had 25 down. That's like the nominal, but then we have actually given back about 14, 15% in inflation. So there's like a hidden tax. So we're actually down 40 odd percent, but wow. a, a decent chunk of it is actually hidden, but we feel it, but you don't see it. That is depressing, James, but, but very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what is interesting though, is because I obviously ran this for the full history of Bitcoin and you can more or less compare 20, like, you know, the, the inflation again, CPI is a lower bound, but 2017 feels like 2019. So what you saw was what you felt. But the magnitude of the debasement that we saw since 2020 was so large that now the feeling is actually quite divergent from what you see. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic. So yeah, I think we've, we've, kind of, it, we've illustrated like why the four-year cycle did exist. Why, why is it going to break? What, what are the, the mechanics? Because my mental framework, yeah. it's going to keep going until it doesn't. And if there's ever a time when it doesn't, it's probably right now. Yeah. Um, ETFs, options, derivatives. How do you think about what breaks this four-year cycle? I think probably the clearest thing is the um, further moving of Bitcoin supply into long term hands. I mean, and it, and it has. Right. So the ETFs are a great example. Um, you, you published a great chart I saw earlier that was the Bitcoin ETF holder cost basis chart. Um, and you were noting that, um, you know, it's dipped the, the exchange rate. BTC USD has dipped below their cost basis multiple times, but yet they haven't sold these ETF, you know, or not in mass. Right. The ETF holders. I think that's that's correct. Like innately, that's how ETF buyers work. They're, it's largely a passive bid. Um, ETFs are widely used by financial advisors, right? Who do not day trade in all of their clients' accounts. They maybe they rebalance periodically. You know, depending on the strategy, it could be every month or every quarter or every year, even right. Um, so I think as more and then and then of course if we throw in allocators, right? The state of Wisconsin Investment Board, a large pension fund buying Bitcoin through the ETFs. There are others. There are nation states. There's the kingdom of Bhutan that's stacking after they mine, right? There's El Salvador. There's MicroStrategy. There's more and more of these entities. And I mean, I, there, I mean there are likely to continue to be more of them, to be clear, I, in my view, over time, that see a long-term value proposition for Bitcoin. And that will absolutely dampen um, volatility. And that what you will be reflected in price, frankly, in my view, like, I think that's one of the clearest reasons that vol will come down over time. And, and that, so that, that, and I think that will impact the cycle. Now you might still be able to see a cycle due to other factors, but it should be compressed would be my, my guess. Um, that that's the number one reason. I think alternatively, if you see, you know, some of what we're seeing this year, there's, there's a second point here, the intra crypto cyclicality that hasn't, happened in 24 but was very much a part of 2017 and 2021 i think that's also partially because of the sort of both on a narrative basis and on an allocation basis the separation of bitcoin from other cryptos right so whether we can look at the cumulative flows in bitcoin and eth etfs is one way to look at it like i said eth btc is another benchmark to look at i think people are increasingly thinking of these as two whole really frankly like separate asset classes and so that um, reduction in cyclicality, right? an ETF advisor, an advisor that manages 100 client accounts and they use the ETF, Bitcoin ETF, to get exposure. When like a new app launches on Tron, they don't like race to Poloniex to sell Bitcoin for TRX, right? In fact, it may not even be possible. Um, I mean, you have ETH ETF, so they could rotate between the two. But um, that stickiness of the Bitcoin capital, I think, is going to go up. And that's going to also dampen the cyclicality inside the intra cycle cyclicality rotation um but that also has an impact of dampening the sort of like that that's a lot of what happened like if you look at the bitcoin alt you know price and the eth price and then like an alt index like it's bitcoin all-time high then it's then it starts to come down and then eth is all-time high like over and over again so mm -hmm. that also dynamic was reinforcing this four-year cycle um and i think it will be dampened over time I think that's a really good take. And I, I use this chart. Um, I take the realized cap, right? The on-chain market cap valuing every coin when it was last moved. And I compare the realized cap for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, and the total stablecoin supply. And I basically look at like a 30-day change. It's like these waves of capital. And you see Bitcoin rips to the first side, 
Then once you get very, very late, top of 2021, top of 2017, then Ethereum starts to go. And yeah. then after that, you get the quote currency, the stable coins start to rip. And we haven't seen that this cycle. We haven't seen that kind of capital rotation. You can actually run the same study on like exchange flows. You can look at it at volume. There's all sorts of things. So I think that that like breaking of the capital waterfall, I think that's also a, a key element. I've definitely noticed just in commentary that um, the, the, the distinction between Bitcoin and alts is quite dramatic. Um, I think these ETFs are going to be a more passive bid, that kind of structural once a month. And if you think about like the people say, you know, if volatility comes down, that's that's super bad. But it's like, you know, if you look at any kind of asset over the long time, volatility comes down, but the price keeps going up because the currency doesn't get stronger, right, over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, the same trade is in play, but ultimately it's, it's this kind of reaching that saturation point. And the bigger Bitcoin gets, the more big money can move into it, right? Yeah. If Bitcoin's a million dollar market cap, you can't move a billion dollars in it. But if it's 10 trillion, you can move a billion dollars without without trouble. So the size of it makes it actually more of a veblen good for these big institutions. I think the Wisconsin pension fund was a was a major development because they're like 0.1% put a toe in and that's $180 million. Yeah. And you just see the scale of this thing. It's massive. Yeah, I agree. And I love the veblen good point. It's totally right. I think as Bitcoin becomes larger and more liquid and less volatile, you really will start to see people straight up be like, oh, the German bund is doing what like sell bitcoin buy bitcoin right it's already on the screens of most major macro traders that i that i know um they may not be trading it like that but they're watching it right because it's an index especially because it's 24 7 right it tends to be a really interesting macro asset when something happens after market hours you can see some of the the reaction in the bitcoin price reacting to macro events like the the um iranian drone attack on israel uh i was in um uh bedford uk uh, when that happened at pete Pete's conference and nothing was open. It was Saturday. It happened on like a Friday evening or Saturday night. I forget. Like it was, there was no markets open except for Bitcoin. And, and, it, and it showed a huge thing and it, it crashed and then rallied back before markets really ended up opening in the States. But like the bigger it gets, the more it can be traded as a true macro asset. So like you should also see narratives like digital gold perform better as a narrative, I think, as it becomes more well capitalized. I fully agree. And actually, strangely enough, I've noticed myself on weekends, I read a headline, I'm like, shit, that looks impactful. The first thing I check is actually the Bitcoin price. And yeah. of course, I'm going to do that more often because I spend my life studying this weird thing. <laughs> but at the yeah. same time, that it is actually my index for what the hell's going on. And I use it as a barometer. Um, sure, in the in the short term, there's noise. But in the in the medium term, it, it's it's very, very informative on, on what's really going on. Absolutely. I think it's going to be more. It's, it's global. It's I, I like to say it's um, you can trade it, and in, in, frankly, I think in more individual nations than the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, it's certainly not bigger than the dollar yet, but I mean, it's it's everywhere. It it knows no borders, and it's twenty four seven, three sixty five, and it's liquid. I mean, it is already quite liquid for for a, a global asset. Yes, and I think it can. I mean, really, if you think about what assets trade in pretty much every fiat currency, it's probably the U.S. dollar, gold, and Bitcoin, and that's not bad for fifteen years of not having a CEO. Good. That's pretty pretty good. Yeah, it's working, man. It's working. It is working. Um, and it's remarkable th- that it does. It, it truly is. I mean, what I can't, the, 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 the Overton window has shifted so dramatically in, in favor of Bitcoin in terms of like the, the discussions that can be had. Like we're not really, I still get like, oh, but do people really use it? Well, I don't, I'm not buying my cup of coffee with it. So I get that all the time. Not, yeah, it must not work. I'm like, well, first of all, the president just bought a bunch of hamburgers, the former president at PubKey with it. But, you know, let's, okay, so it is possible to be clear. But it, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, um, I do view it um, primarily as a digital gold like, um, you know, asset. And for long term, it, it, now it's tradable and movable, but it's, you know, you're not buying AWS credits to run your tech company using gold, like, right? I mean, in fact, it's a good argument. As an argument I used to make for Ethereum, although then they started trying to become ultrasound money. And I was like, you're kind of screwing with the narrative here, guys. Which was like you need shittier, faster money. Like that's that's what powers things like entrepreneurship and innovation. It's not that you get none if you're on a hard money standard, but I I don't buy for a second that like a fully deflationary world economy uh, currency as the one currency is definitely good for everything. I think it has positive benefits, but you know a bunch of venture uh, back startups trying and failing with new technology like that needs faster money right and and same thing like you don't want to be spending like if i'm spending digital gold i want to be getting like stone and like brick in return i don't want to be 
you know, but it's a trade for another scarce asset. That's the way exactly. I but it. like so, yes. some innovations require like, you know, Elon Musk, I don't want to give him Bitcoin to fund SpaceX and have him tell me that he's going to blow up like 85 rockets before he gets one to work. But like we that that's what needs to happen. Right. Like he needs to blow those rockets up so that he can get the ones, you know, the the whatever they're called now, a Titan. I forget the names of his um, dragon, like for him to get these ones that are successful required burning a lot of capital. And I don't really want to burn my hard dollars for something like that necessarily. So I think there's a place for shitty money in the economy. Um, and so why, why do I need to spend, uh, immortalize my coffee transaction on the world's most permanent, like digital stone tablet ledger ever created? Like, I don't want to, I don't need that transaction memorialized forever there. Like let's use something shittier for that. Yep. No, I, I actually fully agree. And I think this lines up with like the, the dual money standard. You need something to save in, something to, to borrow in. That's exactly. ultimately how I think about it. Um, I don't That's see right. fair currency going anywhere just because governments won't allow it to go anywhere. I think it's a very useful tool for them. If we all had the printer, we'd use it as well. Um, yeah. So I think it's one of those things where like it, I, I, having that dual system makes a lot of sense. And I think that's probably the the most sane path to bet on. Um, there's got, kind of got two more questions as we start to wrap this thing up. The first one is I want to talk about like big catalysts you see coming down the pipeline. Like what's what's kind of the next big things on your radar? And then I thought maybe we could close out with a bit of a, like, what's the bear case? And then close out with a bit more fun. Like, what's what's the bull case moving forward? Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple. I would say in general, there aren't that many catalysts on the known catalysts on the horizon, right? They're not like there was. Again, this is what I was saying last fall was so ex exuberant. We had this, like, very people that followed closely, like, knew that the SEC probably was going to have to approve these. But the market didn't fully know. So like because it's, you know, we're talking about like SEC filings and regulation stuff. Not that many people get how that stuff works. It was very, very bullish, very clear bullish catalyst on the horizon. Today, I think the number one thing to watch is the U.S. presidential election. I think um, uh, like a Kamala Harris victory is neutral, I would say. I don't view it as catastrophic. I think I don't think that the governments, the U.S. governments, um, stance on Bitcoin and digital assets can really get much more negative than it has been under Biden. And, and it's been bad. There's been plenty of, you know, Operation Choke Point and, and in my view, like over overreach and jurisdictional overreach by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're here. I mean, we've we made we, all time we still highs all time in high. 21 and in, and in 24. I mean, at least not adjusted for inflation. Um, so like, right, it didn't kill Bitcoin. It certainly did not. So it's not like the worst case. It's not like that bad. But I don't see a lot of evidence at the moment that Kamala Harris is um, materially different on crypto policy and in digital asset policy than Joe Biden. Some people disagree with me on this. But, um, you know, she she just said something the other day on Sunday um, that she supports innovation in areas like AI and digital assets. I think that's something it was either supports innovation or supports growth or whatever. That's literally the bare minimum that you could say and like growth in digital assets. That could mean a lot of things. That could mean, you and know, that was that's a caveat a to it, wasn't there? Like assuming it's investor protection. Well, exactly. So th that could mean, well, we got to protect investors from Bitcoin, but allow the growth in digital assets to happen in CBDCs, for example. Like that would be right. truthful and with, you know, and in line with what she said. So she hasn't said enough. So I, you know, I think it's relatively likely that her presidency and her appointees, her economic advisors, her regulatory uh, commissioners would be similar to Biden and therefore, you know, neutral or, or um, a continuation of the status quo. Obviously, on the other side, Trump, a Trump victory, I think, is a, a very clear catalyst. It's not just because of the words that he has said, but the people that are advising him. We know like he, he is surrounded by many individuals who are likely to take prominent roles in his administration who openly support Bitcoin and digital assets. So that I think there's a known whereas the people surrounding Kamala are like Bharat Ramamurthy and Brian Nelson and Brian Deese, these people from the Biden administration who literally worked on Biden's anti crypto policy. So like you just have to look at those two. Um, so that's one. I, I do have another one, but I don't know if you, you, what are you, you know, also I always wonder this, I'm actually in Hong Kong right now. And when I talk about this big, you know, American election catalyst, I feel a little imperialist. Like it, it should, is it really that? And like, should, does it, you know, like what, what's your take on, is that, ha you know, as someone who's not in the States, I mean, what's your take on the U S election impacting? Crypto? Yeah. So, so, so my take is I recently muted the words Kamala, Trump <laughs> and president from my Twitter feed. Um, unfortunately it, it improved it, but it just filled it with all sorts of other nonsense. Um, so <laughs> it, look, I, I think there is probably, I mean, I was in Nashville, right? So I, um, my my big picture takeaway from the Trump 
speech is first and foremost, it was 85% a rally that you would give to any, anywhere else. So I agree that the main storyline, in my opinion, was the advisors who sit behind him. The fact that Cynthia Lummis came out afterwards with a piece of paper. And again, that's that's a piece of paper. It's not signed in. That's got to go through that whole process. But the takeaway for me, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is being talked about at the same level as the gold sitting in or maybe not sitting in Fort Knox. That's yeah. ultimately how I look at it. It's like, that's not bad for 15 years with no CEO. And I just look at that kind of broad scale of things. Look, in terms of what the election does, I, I, I would agree with your assessment. I think there probably is going to be a, a no change if, if, if Kamala gets in. Um, probably more so, just a just a more pro um, approach. I think there's also going to be the whole economic impacts, like ha what happens in terms of the economy with these two different... Because the big difference is these aren't like slightly different policies. If we look at Australian politics, it's the same guy, just different shirt, right? If you look at the US, it, you are talking about two polar different approaches yeah. to the whole system. So I think... Which is rare, just by that the way, even for the US. This is like a Trump kind of... Uh, phenomenon, to be honest, like I'm, I'm a little bit cynical about um, the two major parties in the U.S. This is the, the the last few elections with Donald Trump. He's one of the few true like it's crazy to say this, but I, I view him as an outsider. It's very rare. Right. I mean, you know, you get two uh, mainstream U.S. senators in in like Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. Right. Or John McCain. Like, you know, it's neither of them fundamentally different on foreign policy. Right. Or on like broad economic policy. Trump, Trump. Harris is a pretty stark contrast in my view. And yeah, no, I agree. On crypto. So, uh, I definitely think that's going to be, I, I'm looking forward to the election being over. So if you Americans can go and just pick someone, please, that'll be good. <laughs> uh, Cause I think that the world can kind of move on. Cause I think there's a lot of things on hold, right? I'm, I'm yeah. sure there's some geopolitical things on hold. I'm sure the mm -hmm. world's waiting for that too. Cause that's volatile no matter where you are. Yeah. Um, all right, so just to, to, to wrap things up, what's your, what's yeah. your bear case for Bitcoin? Oh, what, more, is it, what does it look like in a real negative? Though, first, that I, I do want to raise one more catalyst because oh, yeah, it's kind of the overhang. The FTX estate. So they've already raised a bunch oh. of cash. They're going to deliver, I think, $15 billion of cash, they said, to their creditor base. Um, there are claims funds in there too, but I mean, it's, it is a credit, creditor base largely comprised of crypto native investors. Um, so I think you you will see coins pump when the when that cash is distributed because some people will buy cryptos with it right it's a fairly large pile of money actually um, that, and we haven't really had one of these like it's like a cash overhang instead of a coin overhang and yes I think people will buy crypto with that all right but sorry go go ahead I just want to throw that one no in and sorry just I don't to know touch when that is that, by actually. the way I think it's probably like end of the year or Q one I forget what the estate has guided but it's it's public you can Google. Yeah, and I, I just want to get it on the record because there's so many people talk about this Bank of America 118x multiplier thing. So let's say you get 15 billion, right? Uh, maybe three, four, five billion of that probably makes it into to, to the bid side. So many people will look and they go, oh, look, that's 100x. Like Mark is going to moon by, you know, 500 billion. That's not how these things work. No. Um, I, I've done a study and it's, it's, I've never seen the multiplier. And you look at like the realized cap change, and there's all sorts of ways you can measure it. The multiplier is never more than eight. It's sort of been eight for a very, very brief second, but it's closer to three to five. So that's, that's, and that's in both directions. So, um, you know, if you're getting a $5 billion inflow, you're probably talking about a 15, 20 odd billion uptick in, in market cap. Um, so yeah, uh, the bear case, what's like the, the one thing that you can kind of look at and go, Hey, ma maybe not so good if this was to play out. And then, uh, maybe we close out on what's the, what's the bull case of Bitcoin moving forward. Yeah, I think the some of the most bearish things, like policy wise, are attempts to regulate uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency developers, miners, nodes as financial institutions. So Elizabeth Warren's proposal in the U.S., the Digital Asset Anti Money Laundering Act. We 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 have this thing called the Bank Secrecy Act in the U.S. that mandates that financial institutions know their customers and stuff. Any attempts to by by major governments to enforce that on open source software developers. Bitcoin miners, Ethereum validators um, is a non-starter for the industry and is very, de very detrimental, right? First of all, it would not be easy to actually enact. So you'd be creating like an unenfor unenforceable prohibition. I mean, it's gonna be pretty hard for you to like prevent us from downloading Bitcoin core, right? Like, so it's a stupid idea. It wouldn't achieve the policy goals, but that is a, that to me is all the other stuff about like which crypto or this or that as a commodity versus security, all that matters, but that's sort of market structure minutia. It's going to be different in different jurisdictions all over the world. It's not a kill shot. I think trying to ban people from owning, you know, using open source software, unless they show their government, their ID, which is um, been proposed. Basically, I think those are bad. I think those are, 
that would be bearish. Um, you, again, it would survive, but it would it would make Bitcoin and Ethereum basically de facto illegal, um, which would be very negative, I think, and bearish for the price. Um, that That's the main threat that I look at as a policy. And, and I literally track like anytime any country or politician in a, or legislator or, you know, regulator suggests this. Um, it's something I track really closely. So that, that would be my main bear case. I think, you know, th the other one is that, you know, I think governments um, return to sound monetary policy and um, they try to clean up their national debts. Um, I just don't think that's like, you know, in which case, you know, the dollar could be great, you know, get a more of a, you know, a dollar that doesn't inflate by, you know, isn't down 99% every hundred years. Like, I mean, yeah, then maybe you don't need digital gold um, as much, but I, I view that as very unlikely. Yeah, the one thing on the ballot is not a fiscally responsible government. Exactly. It doesn't seem likely. And then, yeah, I mean, like when I look at all that, I, I tend to agree that really those regula regulation are the only primary areas of, of key risk. And I think the bull case, at least for me, is that like, what the hell else is there? We've got through all these supply overhangs, you've got ETFs so that asset managers can start moving money in. Sure, there's, you know, there, there's going to be arguments of the price suppression with derivatives, but also it's like, you know, these derivatives are going to happen. It's part of assets growing up this is part of the process yeah um you know these are the, just kind of the unstoppable wins in the market you know the s p 500 is driven by options and look at it, it just goes up only so you know it, it, these are the dynamics that um that, that fiat money does that's exactly right yeah i couldn't have said it better james alex what a fantastic uh, conversation thanks for coming on and uh, where can people find you oh yeah check me out on twitter intangible coins um the coins they are not tangible um, and go to galaxy.com slash research to read our content. And, and listen uh, for to those Galaxy who don't, Brains. I was going to say, for those yeah. who don't, listen to Galaxy Brains because it's, uh, it's one on my regular uh, podcast rotation. Mate, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Check.